muted. Sorry, sorry to break in. I just um, wasn't. I was on mute and I couldn't unmute myself. <laughs> Um, and before we get uh, too far down the road, excuse me, Deb, um, I wanted to just talk a little bit about uh, how we ended up having this phone call uh, because of the interest that the board had in supporting new managers and um, finding ways to help welcome them with actual information that they needed to keep uh, to make their first year a success and to hit the ground running because everyone has to run, whether you're being chased or whether you're running to something, um, it seems like uh, our programs are always moving so fast and the requirements are so big. Um, and so uh, uh, we have uh, today, we're looking at how to, um, with how we want to revise or review um, and add, potentially add a welcome module to our transit manager toolkit because it's important for us to keep our information relevant, but also um, work with the board to identify what that module would have in it and some of the I, things that all of you have done to uh, make sure that you were successful in that first year and things you learned you know, after that um, or during that year that you wish you'd known when you'd started. So um, with that, Deb, do you want to talk about your uh, 12 years working with the exec as the executive director of Southern Nevada Transit Coalition? Uh, sure, I'd be honored to. Uh, I uh, have a similar background as George. I uh, started as the one of the board members of the organization back in 2002, and then I've uh, over the time I got talked into being the treasurer, and then over the, after that I uh, they, I was talked into being the executive director. Um, so I came into it totally new, uh, totally green, if you will. Uh, I'm an accountant as well. And um, so I, I relied on a lot of stuff. I was kind of like a sponge and took in everything I could from the different places I could find information. Uh, my staff as well, as far as operations go, but as far as grant writing and all that, this was completely new to me. So I relied a lot, um, believe it or not, of course, on National RTAP. Um, I found that through the Community Transportation Association um, at their expo. So that's how I knew about National RTAP. And it sounds like I'm tuning our own horn here, but it really truly was a wealth of information. And from there, I got the uh, uh, TCRP, uh, CTAA was a huge resource. Um, FTA circulars were, I mean, although not bestseller reading, they certainly were uh, a wealth of information there. And I relied heavily on our Nevada DOT and as well as our MPO, which is the RTC of Southern Nevada. So I was just reaching out basically to anyone that had any information at all and taking it all in. Thanks, Deb. Um, is there something that you wish you had um, you you had known when you first started that you know now? Oh, probably the best thing would have been the FTA circulars because then, you know, knowing where to go because it's an overwhelming amount of information. And I think if I had known more specific where, where to find things that I had specific questions on, like what were allowable expenses under 5311 grants, you know, without having to pour through the entire register and trying knowing specifically where to go to find the information would have been really helpful. Yeah. I, I agree. They provide some structure to everything that happens. So um, the next person is Sharon Peeler, Executive Director at Jackson County Transportation in Mariana, Florida. So Sharon, what what can you help us with if we're the first manager? What happened to you that we can learn from? Uh, Robin, I think Sharon was having a little trouble as well getting on. She, it looks like she's on the computer also. Yeah, and um, she's muted. So I'll let her know that she's um, not, I can't hear her. Okay. So um, one of the things that we did uh, when putting this call together is we um, put out uh, questions for people, or people sent us questions that they wanted to um, ask, or that we want, they wanted you guys to respond to. And um, I thought, you know, one of the things that helped me when I was, uh, and this is, I guess we are doing that, is when I started in my first position doing transit work was talking to and listening to the people around me who 
knew what was going on. Um, and that was really helpful in that first year, but in the long run, reading those policies and guidance that really defined the context of the work that I was doing really helped me to um, be uh, very productive and um, effective. And, and I, I actually had an internal committee that I worked with to help me um, work with the problems I was dealing with and to test ideas I had because I didn't have a lot of context. It was good to have people who knew more than me uh, about the process and the organization helping me navigate through the organization. So um, the first question that we have is about uh, finding training and uh, how do you find uh, training for drivers in rural areas, especially with um, the Medicaid brokerage um, gu guidelines, and some states have uh, guidelines that have to be met in order for a, a operator to be able to provide Medicaid trips. So how do people um, access that training? How do people find that? George? Well, um, you know, a lot of it is, is on the computer. What, what we do at our organization, we will uh, have a driver during the day, we'll, we'll take him up in the operations office and let him go through the course, and, and uh, we'll have somebody there with him if they have any problems with it, because, you know, there are some people who aren't quite as computer savvy, and, and, it, and it's hard to tell them kind of do it at home, but uh, we just replace them on the road and, and have someone else, um, you know, do their run, and, and they go up and do it during the workday. And... And in our situation here in West Virginia, we have MTM as our uh, broker for Medicaid transport, and, and they offer some classes to take. And it works out real nice because it gives you a certain time to take them, and then once you're finished and pass it, it will let you print out a, um, a certificate that you can put in their file. So that is, that is one way that uh, we, we get some of those courses in for uh, – for our drivers. Okay. Um, also with us today we have uh, Jenny Rowland who is also on the board and um, I wanted to uh, let her uh, make, make sure that she had a chance to talk about um, some of the trials she's had in becoming a transit manager out of the blue uh, and working with the tribal program. So um, Jenny, when you are, in, if you are interested, um, I I'm happy to um, give you a chance to talk about your experience because you are probably the newest transit manager that we have on um, our board. Great. Oh, I am unmuted. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, Hello. Good. Hi. Hi, Jenny. Oh, excellent. You can hear me. I was wondering if I was... Uh, you have to That's speak good. into your microphone because um, from, you're going in and out. So you be really um, just speak slowly. Oh, and okay. Speak. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Is that work? Okay, good. Um, yes, yeah, so I came from a logistics background, um, dispatching for Wildland Fire, managing one of their com uh, communication centers and uh, then when it's transit. So it was, it was uh, a lot of the same concepts did, uh, you know, roll over very easily. What I found, um, because I, when I was on a conference call one time, someone mentioned RTAP, and that's possible trainings. This was very early on. And so I started, you know, making calls and trying to find out what this RTAP was. And I found that it's been uh, very beneficial for uh, my program since, you know, I was hired to actually start the program. Uh, what I did first was I accessed the RTAP mentorship program. So I was assigned a mentor who is also a woman who is also doing tribal transit, Emma Featherman Sam with Oglala Sioux. And that uh, what gave me an individual uh, direct line, someone who had already set up their program, someone you could bounce ideas off of. 
I found the mentorship program very beneficial. Oh, that's great, Jenny. Now I'm going to see whether we can get uh, whether Sharon is able to um, join us. Sharon, can you hear now? Okay. No, we're still having sound issues with Sharon. Um, so the question about the Medicaid brokerages is one where, you know, um, Deb, do you work with Medicaid? Uh, no, no, we don't. Okay. So uh, one of the things is that Deb had a real different approach to um, developing training for her program because it's spread out over a large area and um, works with a, um, what I would, a lot of uh, special needs populations. So, Deb, you want to talk a little bit about your training program? Yeah, uh, sure. Um, we have a, one of our supervisors. She was uh, trained on um, certified by National Safety Council. Um, they're out of Phoenix, and uh, it's a really good uh, resource. So she actually trains all of our personnel, our safety-sensitive personnel, going from CPR first aid, elder abuse, uh, defensive driving, bloodborne, airborne, everything that FTA requires, and actually we exceed FTA requirements. Uh, their, their, their standards are our minimum. So we, we put a really high emphasis on training. And in fact, our trainer is so wonderful that the uh, Nevada DOT, uh, I call it farming her out, so we share her with other organizations unrelated to us statewide. Yeah, I think that that whole idea of having, um, you know, when you're in a rural area, looking at how you potentially can support getting training that other organizations in your area need. Um, you know, you have the volunteer fire department, EMTs, but also for schools, school bus drivers, uh, looking to ways that um, you can build the capacity in your community that the trainer that you need is what someone that um, other um, organizations need. We also have uh, Charla Sloan on the line who is another one of our board members and she uh, manages transit for uh, seven counties in Oklahoma um, that are highly rural and two tribes. So um, Charla, I'm unmuting you I think. I did already, Robin. Oh, okay, super. Thanks. Hi Charla. I think we lost her. You know, Robin, it's Deb. Uh-huh. Oh, here she um, is. You know, oh, okay, never mind. Well, I just... It's open, but I don't know that she can, um, can use her uh, computer, and she's on her computer rather than the phone. Okay, so go ahead, Deb. Well, no, I just think a really good resource for the people listening might be to call their state DOT, find out what organization has a certified trainer, and then go from there because, you know, I'm sure that Nevada is not unique and, you know, the sharing of trainers. So I think that's probably where I would start. There wasn't one in Nevada, so we basically created one with the Nevada DOT's permission, if you will. And then, therefore, all the people, all the rural providers in the state now have access to a trainer. And not every organization is going through certification for a trainer because it's very, very expensive. Um, right. in, in West Virginia, the uh, West Virginia Division of Public Transit, they contract with RLS, and they give each of our 18 agencies a chance to uh, schedule with them uh, a week. And, and, you know, we have a a list of what kind of training they could give. So, like she said, that your your uh, division of public transit in the state can help out as well. Right. Hey, Robin. Uh -huh. Robin. Yes. Charlotte submitted her uh, comments in the uh, in the questions box. She says that uh, they had their trainer become a certified instructor for CPR, and this helped us get the training we when needed, and the cost wasn't that much. That's great. Because it, it is something that's, you know, to keep people, um, keep their certifications up, it does take a, 
having access to the training pretty regularly. Okay. Um, and I know that some. Um, uh, this is, sorry. Go ahead. I was just. This is Jenny. I was mm -hmm. just saying um, that we also share a trainer with a nearby transit, Arrowhead Transit, which is a very large transit, uh, but it's still fairly in, close to our region. Mm -hmm. And so we share a, a trainer, and so then uh, he's able to offer classes more often. And that's Arrowhead Transit is a larger organization, and so that you're able to share in their resources or share their expertise. Yeah? Right, and they're large enough where they have a dedicated trainer. That's great. Um, some, in some cases, I know that the um, trainings that are needed for the brokerages are actually provided by the brokerage managers, and uh, that th the knowledge about who the operators are that are um, using, if you have to have a certification in order to be a brokerage, um, provide brokerage drives, that uh, then they're able to track that and do um, uh, cost-effective uh, training and making sure that all their drivers are able or have this, that level of knowledge. Uh, let's see. So, and George mentioned that, and I think this is another area, especially for driver training, that you uh, might want to think about is that the insurance companies who are insuring you are very interested in your drivers being um, very well trained and reducing the chance for accidents and um, injuries. And so oftentimes the drivers uh, are have access through you have access uh, for driver training through your insurance company. Uh, and one of the things that we do have with our with National RTAP now is the learning management system, and we have the to the point training, and um, the, some of the safety trainings that have uh, modules for drivers and for driver safety, and you can track your drivers using those uh, online, and they're able to access those at home or uh, at your office. So I think looking for ways to um, bring information, make information more available, and uh, provide access to all your drivers so that you have everyone being really aware um, and being able to, especially when you have changes of seasons, get everyone on the same page for safety is really important. Uh, and, and Robin, this, you know, another thing that we, we need to be aware of is, is the reporting of the people that attend the classes, and then also be aware that if someone happens to miss that class, that you've got to go back and you know and make sure you, you're able to give them that 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 training. You know that was something that was missing sometime. But uh, to have a nice uh, way of reporting it and putting it in the uh, employee's file when you do give training. Right, and now um, uh, Charla's on the phone, and she's used the LMS quite a bit for doing some of her training, and so. I would be interested in um, hearing about some of the trainings that uh, she's done with her, or if that's been helpful for her in keeping her drivers trained. Because that's one of the reasons why um, we pursued the LMS is so that when you were in really rural or very dispersed locations, like Jenny <laughs> up in northern Minnesota, that uh, the trainings you need um, would be more available. Mm -hmm. um, we also have a note from um, jo uh, Johnny Cusick from Nebraska, and uh, she uh, has, uh, oh, God, I just lost this, there we go. Uh, where did it go? Um, she has, we utilize Nebraska Safety Center through the University of Nebraska at Kearney. So, you know, when you think about opportunities for finding uh, training, don't limit yourself to calling in the phone book, but uh, schools, universities, uh, trade schools, uh, community colleges, uh, 
your local fire, you know, your local volunteer fire department are places that um, sometimes can help you provide access to the trainings you need, especially things like CPR. Um, Okay. Uh, another thing that there was a question, Robin, was about training more than one uh, one at a time, mm -hmm. and you know, again, th that's a recording thing. You might not be able to get a certificate. Uh, printed out for each one, but if you have uh, like an overhead projector or something and have, say, your whole workforce, then that's when that reporting comes in where um, you can put it in their file that they were all there for that training. Right. Um, and so one of the questions that we'd received was, um, are, how many can you provide training to at once? On, online. The online training is available, it's disaggregated so that anybody can um, be on it. You could have a hundred people on the training at the same time, um, but they would be each in a computer, each have to be on their own computer. Um, and um, I think that one of the other things that uh, people run into when they start with uh, doing um, transit management is you aren't just a transit manager, you might be the dispatcher, you might be the HR manager, you probably are. Um, and so you're having to pick up a lot of different skills and uh, utilize those all at once. So um, do you, any of you have some uh, great ideas about how to find good uh, uh, employees when you're trying to find transit employees in a rural area? Well, hey, Robin, in our area in West Virginia, a lot of times we will use uh, school bus drivers um, as, as part-time drivers. Uh, we'll have some come in during the day, like in between their runs, and uh, that works out real well for us. And we also, we have a limited schedule on our Saturday, and we actually use uh, high sc or, uh, school bus drivers to do our runs on Saturday. Yeah. Robin? Uh-huh. Hi, Denny. Is Hi. This um, yes, and we, uh, we uh, use uh, a great resource is the like American Legion or Veterans of Foreign Wars because veterans are the best, uh, some of the best employees that you have. At least we find that. And they're not necessarily, they don't want full time, but they're looking for something to do. And that's really worked out well for us, it's, you know. So you look in different types of places. Um, we try to, we know what our job we're trying to fill for, and we look for people that fit that. Maybe they don't know how to do it, but we certainly train them, and it's worked very well for us. So here, Charla? So are there any other um, uh, ideas from people about uh, ways that they can uh, develop uh, employees or find employees in um, when they're trying to uh, meet uh, their uh, human resource needs or find employees out in rural areas? Again, in West Virginia, what we do is, is we kind of have, you know, you can drop off an application at any time. and some of the, uh, the areas that we've been able to find some employees are like early retirement, uh, and they're looking for something to, you know, you might not have that long-term employee, but they're usually good for like that five, 
to 10 years, which nowadays that might be long term. So we have a question from Courtney Stewart, and she says she's in a small rural community, and if you're able to find drivers, they encounter obstacles in trying to get their CDLs because of all the DOT changes that were made back on July 1st of 2015. Have uh, George, have you or Deb um, run into CDL issues? Well, what we do again here in West Virginia, we, we help them as much as we can. We'll, um, like, uh, we'll hire them as a part-time driver where they uh, can just do under 15 passengers. And then we'll help train them. And when they're ready and they, they pass their uh, written part, then we help them on the, um, uh, the driving part of it. We just recently had a driver uh, that worked for it for about a year, and he was able to pass his CDL with the P endorsement, so now he's available to do more runs for us. Well, that's great. Um, Deb, have you worked with CDLs or helping your drivers get CDLs? Yeah, we used to. Um, unfortunately, with the, the rule changes that she's speaking of in July, um, in that became where you had to have a minimum number of tests um, per year. And the, being a rule, we didn't meet that. But prior to there, prior to that point, uh, until last July, we would uh, we had our own third-party certifier. So we would actually take people who had the. I always say you can take a willing person and make them capable, but you can't always take a capable person and make them willing. So. When we had the willing person, the driver, we would oh. encourage them to move on and get their C uh, CDL, and we would help them. Oh, that's great. Um, we have another idea from Elizabeth McClurg about um, places that you can re recruit um, good drivers. And she has had luck with working with the local PTA because you have stay-at-home moms looking for part-time work, and they're, an mm. un they're often untapped and available for many of the peak hours because... Um, the peak school hours are different than the peak work hours. Um, I have a comment about the uh, CDL license. Uh huh. Yes, um, we had a problem with. We try to facilitate the license here as much as we can. Um, like George said, starting them on the the, the smaller buses and giving them that time to, to train up and uh, putting like the DOT practice tests on the computer in the driver's lounge and that kind of stuff. Yeah. But our main problem was getting the appointments, getting the appointments with the, the DOT, the DMVs. Mm -hmm. yeah, it, was, it would take months. The, the backlog is, it was terrible. So I contacted uh, Minnesota DOT and, you know, uh, expressed our concern about, um, you know, we're supposed to meet these requirements within a certain length of time, but it's taking us four to six months to even get an appointment. And uh, they connected us with uh, someone who facilitated that, and we were able to find, we had to go drive a lot further, but we got everybody tested on the same day at the same time. So I sent a qualified driver and a bus and then a group of people over. It was two hours away, one one way, but we got it all done. But squeaky wheel, I guess, is I just expressed my concerns and they were able to solve the problem. That's great. I mean, I think that's an important part of um, resolving conflicts or issues is recognizing that they're not just yours, that there's other people out there that can help you respond to this. Um, we had a comment from Charla. Sloan, and that the biggest issue she's run into in getting CDL drivers is getting a physical. So um, have any of you run into uh, that, that issue as part of your um, maintaining certified drivers? We, this is Deb. Um, we didn't have any issues prior to, I think it was last year or it could be uh, later this year, where you have to, when you renew your CDL medical card, you know, your medical card for your CDL, now you have to go to someone who's actually been approved by, I believe, uh, FTA Federal Motor Carrier. So that in a rural community is going to make it much more difficult. Um, prior to that, our, our drivers would go to either their physician or, you know, in some cases a chiropractor because the number of medical 
you know, doctors in an area is so limited. But now it's going to be more difficult. They're going to have to travel uh, much further distance to find one that is uh, licensed and registered, approved by FDA. Right. Is your um, DOT facilitating this at all so that you're able to um, get more information about uh, who is certified and who isn't? Because it seems like Motor Carry might have a list. Yeah, they do. Federal Motor Carry. We haven't really, really been working with our DOT on that, but we have been working with a uh, Federal Motor Carrier. Um, we have a comment from... Uh, Bruce Morrow, and he said many school districts have third-party examiners that can be contracted to give CDL driving tests. Is the school bus um, uh, using school buses is covers everywhere? So uh, I think they have the same issues we do in a lot of ways around uh, getting uh, rural uh, drivers, rural employees um, certified. Um, and he says that there's a list on the FTA website so that uh, if you're looking for the certified um, driving, it's, it, I think he's talking about the driving tests, that um, you can get that on the website. Um, and another hey, question. Robin, going back to the, um, the physicals, well, we're, we're fortunate to have a clinic nearby here in uh, by our uh, agency. Now, the state requires us to get one every year, even though FTA, we can get them for up to two years. But, and one of the problems of coming is that, you know, blood pressure and different things, sometimes we only get them for six months and uh, nine months. And uh, uh, the other thing that we almost lost the driver was getting a pacemaker. Uh, mm -hmm. Once they get that, then uh, they can have a defibrillator but not a pacemaker or something like that. Right. And a lot of this is coming about because of the hours of service and the issues with um, private charter driving and um, the right. also the uh, long-haul truckers who have out really strict hours of service and many more issues around um, uh, driving safety. So uh, one of our... Um, Attendees, Courtney Stewart, um, her microphone isn't working, so I'm going to just read her question or t her um, comment. Um, she just hired a driver, and it took him two months to pass the CDL driving and um, pre-trip uh, test, and she worked with him and supervised training sessions at the local school bus uh, with the local school bus supervisor, and there would be no way that she would be able to pass the test today as, um, as she did three years ago. Um, his pre-trip took an hour and the driving took 45 minutes. They nitpicked at every single little thing um, and especially at things like high, highlights, uh, headlights hazy. So they were um, picking on how uh, old the, high, the headlights were. Uh, they docked him because he started in the cab instead of under the hood but never told him where to start and wouldn't let him come out of the cab and go to the engine compartment. Uh, maybe we just had a problem tester. Uh, so I think that uh, the, that brings up the issue of uh, the local motor carrier, they don't, do, uh, they don't usually have much uh, interaction with transit and transit vehicles and passenger endorsements. and. Um, they have varying levels of understanding about the industry and about the training that you have. So um, I think running into something like Courtney Stewart was saying is um, something you just have to be aware of and look for the um, uh, you know the, the people who actually understand it and maybe share information about and uh, people who understand what you're what you're trying to do or what you do. And with your CDL. Um, and Bruce uh, Morrow was clarifying that the list of, on the FTA website is for certified medical examiners, so that if you're looking for one in your area, you can go um, to the FTA website uh, to check and what one, who is in your area. And um, Terry Hoffman uh, is asking if any one of you would be able to speak about writing grants and fundraising. Are there tools out there for writing grants and searching for grants? Deb? Well, I mean, I hate to say, I just look everywhere and anywhere, and uh, 
we've been, as far as fundraisers go, um, we've been very fortunate to have a fun, um, an event that's been going on for over nine years. And it's a, you know, we had to come up with something to, to have match money for our senior transit, which the demand of which, which I'm sure all the listeners have, is exploding, yet the money can't keep up with the demand. So uh, we have a great, it's a, an annual wine tasting and charity silent auction, and it's well attended, uh, 400 people, and it's been a real big hit. We raise typically around $30,000 a year. And uh, besides that, we have a uh, bowling tournament. You know, we try to find things where we have, uh, um, we use a lot of our employers, the people that we take their employees to on the bus, and they always help us because they certainly realize the importance of getting their employees to work. So we found a lot of partnerships there going with people that were providing transportation to their employees or to their stores, you know, to their stores to spend money. And they're, they're uh, very eager to jump on and help you by donating items and things like so, that. So we've been very successful. So, Deb, um, when, you're, when you first started, where did you look for training about how to write a grant? Um, well, uh, National RTAP, the RTAP stuff, the uh, CTAA was a, a huge help. Um, TCI, I mean, basically anywhere that I could. I did have an advantage because I, I am an accountant and I uh, uh, do a lot of writing anyway, and so that wasn't the problem. The problem was basically finding potential sources. And do you have um, ideas about where people can look? Are there websites that um, have uh, grant resources or do you have experience looking for that type of thing? Somewhat, but you know, I mean, I go out there and try to look at any grants. I mean, not just transportation related, and then see what the mission is of that granting agency, and see if there's somehow it aligns with at least a portion of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, so don't don't just. I guess my best uh, advice would be don't just look for transportation grants. Kind of broaden your scope and look for any kind of grant and see if the mission of that organization is something that fits in with one of the the tasks that you're doing. Super. Um, George? And another way for fundraising is um, possibly putting uh, advertising on your buses. You know, we, we use the perforated uh, uh, vinyl that we put on just on the windows, and, and we, uh, we get different contracts for that. So you're talking about um, advertising on your bus? Yes. And you, you, you were saying that you do that with wraps. Well, we do it kind of with, say, just like a 24-inch by 32-inch window, and uh, and and they make a vinyl that's perforated, so you can you see the advertising on the outside, and you see through it on the inside. Cool. And and we just put it on windows rather than putting it on the painted part where you cover up your logos or things like that. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay, so um, let's see. So I I know that um, grant writing is a it's a real skill, and uh, one of the things is that uh, we have materials that can help you. Um, I would also look. Uh, community colleges often have uh, grant writing courses because you have community organizations, and they want to build the skill set uh, in the community to. To write grants, uh, and I would look online, uh, not just at RTAP's uh, published materials, but uh, to some of the webinars that may be available around that. Uh, and that was one of the grant writing was one of the sessions that was requested by the Tribal Caucus for the conference we had in Denver, and I am sure. Uh, that in 2017, when RTEP does its ne next technical assistance conference, we'll be looking for opportunities. Um, we'll be looking. We'll probably be bringing in um, a grant writing as one of the classes because, just like safety, uh, the training that we all um, have, it's great when we get the training and we we're working in it. But most of us have employees that move through our organizations. And if you don't use skills, that always helps helps to sharpen them up. So, I think that um, you know 
keep asking for training if you need it, and um, we'll keep looking for ways to bring it to you um, in from a distance perspective. Robin? So, yes? It's again. It's Deb again. Um, you know, another thing that's very helpful is to find another nonprofit in your area, even, you know, completely unrelated to transportation, someone who's an experienced grant writer in, you know, like say a food bank. Because mm -hmm. grant writing is grant writing, and they, they can really be a wealth of information, give you a, a grant prop perhaps that they wrote the year prior, and then you can get a feel for what information a funding, a potential funder is looking for. Right. So you're, in a way, that you're talking about finding a you know, local mentor and see yeah. if you can um, find your aligned interests and um, have that person help you be successful in uh, developing your skill set. Yes, and then pay it forward and help someone else once you have, once you have it. That's what we do. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, let's see. Well, I um, I don't have any further. Oh, here we go. Here's another comment from Bruce Morrow. Um, state and regional transit associations often have grant writing sessions in their annual conferences. That is another place where you can really connect in and connect with your local um, or your state transit association. And it doesn't hurt to tell them this is a priority for us. We need to get better at our grant writing skills. And um, I know that with the Oregon DOT and the Washington DOT where I worked with their state conferences, uh, we often, and I'd say almost always, had a grant writing class there. And it's worth um, prioritizing going to the conference sometimes so that you can pick up some of these um, really uh, of the moment uh, skills that you need. Okay, so are, do we have any more questions? And um, for the panelists, I have to apologize for our technical difficulties in this and um, my, I feel like I'm just learning so many of these things. We'll be posting the questions and answers to questions. Uh, we have uh, the link for the um, medical registry from FMCSA that uh, Bruce Morrow put into the questions. And uh, we'll be happy to share that. Uh, I think that uh, when we get our when we get our, um, uh, our transit manager toolkit revisions together, um, there'll be opportunities for people to uh, share their strategies, and we want to make sure that we get um, a good um, uh, selection for people. Uh, we also had a question about uh, for George and about what is what is a reasonable cost for the bus window advertisements. How long do they stay up, and um, how much? How much does it? Act, how much are you able to get from a, an an advertiser? Well, I, well, what we do, we like to set up a contract where they where they get it for a year, um, and we charge fifty dollars per window, and we like to put two on on each bus. I mean, I've. I've done some research where some charge a little more for curbside than they do the other side of the, the bus, but um, or like the driver's side. But we charge $50 per window, plus we charge the advertiser um, the production for that. And 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 uh, we've we've got a company that we get a buy, and it it runs about that $50 a window as well. But they charge per square inch, so of course if you get a bigger window, say you do the back window or something, and there's more square inches, it, it may cost a little more. But we just do a pass-through on, on the production of the, um, the perforated vinyl, and then uh, we like to charge $50 per window and, and set up a contract. And, and really, I mean, we'll, we'll do a month if somebody, you know, uh, the longer they do it, the cheaper it is per month because you can factor in that uh, production cost. Right, so it's fifty dollars a month that they pay for that year. Yeah, per window, and we try to get them to put it on both sides of the bus. But we'll do whatever they want, to tell you the truth. And we keep it all in house. And you may be able to find, you know, if you have a local uh, billboard company, you may be able to contract through them, and you know, and uh, 
and and they they look for advertisers for you. Oh, oh no, that's yeah, that's uh, it's a kind of a win-win relationship there. Well, matter of fact, we just recently got a little billboard that was a, a five by ten. You know, we always wanted to do it, and and it's costing us about one hundred seventy-five dollars a month. But what happened was. When I talked to the salesperson, they said, you know, somebody talked to me about advertising on a bus, and it's a local uh, telemarketing group. So I paid the 175 a month. I got a call. We've got a 2000 a month contract out of that uh, setup. Oh, no, there you go. That's great, George. Um, yeah. So I think we are uh, finished for the uh, with a call. I don't see any more questions and we'll be posting the um, uh, information on the on the um, web uh, in the next couple days and we will post the answers to the questions uh, as well. So um, I would really uh, encourage you if there's other things that you wanted to ask and you didn't get a chance, um, please just send us a uh, an email, and we'll be we'll happy to we're happy to look for information for you. Uh, we do that anytime, but I think uh, especially if you have things that uh, you think would have really helped you if you had known them uh, when you first started, because I think that you know there's nothing scarier than walking into an office or a cubicle and saying, "Oh, what now?" Uh, and then wondering what can blindside you because things always do, whether it's uh, your drivers are, you know, you need to replace a driver and you have no way to find them or um, you're looking at how to contract for or how to purchase uh, equipment for your office and how does that work. So people who are doing this um, uh, as transit managers pick up a lot of skills on the way and I know that the people on the phone are all interested in sharing the pieces that they've been able to pick up. So thank you everybody for um, joining us and um, we look forward to working with you in the coming year. Thanks everyone. All right, thank you. Thanks.